All right, so moving into the digestive system. So we're going to talk about just kind of reviewing some of the anatomy and then getting into the more detailed processes of the cells of the digestive system and how they contribute to digestion. So before we begin, looking kind of back at where we've been already, is what part of the nervous system controls and promotes digestion? Do you remember? Parasympathetic, yep. And the parasympathetic division is part of what overall division? Autonomic, yep. And the autonomic nervous system is controlled by what part of the brain? The hypothalamus, very good, very good. So you're bringing that knowledge forward, and that's excellent. So we're gonna talk about how this process occurs and some issues that happen when stress gets in the way, right? Because stress is part of what division? Sympathetic, which is the fight or flight or stress response. And are we stressed as a nation? Yeah, right, we're stressed over lots of things, right? And that impairs digestion, bless you, times three. <laughs> Do you always sneeze in trios? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're going to start with the digestive tract. So we know digestion begins in the mouth. We bring food in, passes into the esophagus. So when we start with the mouth and the esophagus, the tissue there is stratified squamous epithelium. And what is the benefit of having stratified squamous epithelium in the entrance and the exit to the digestive tract? Yeah, if you're eating taco chips, that's gonna rip into that mucosal lining and do a little damage, but if we have many layers of flattened cells, we can handle that, and it's not gonna damage those underlying tissues. So stratified squamous epithelium, it, it's a protective thing, and that's, a, that's good because, like Laura said, you know, we know we have, we have foods that are not always smooth and soft. So as we get to the stomach, though, it becomes simple columnar. So once we get down a little lower, it transitions to simple columnar. And that, the benefit of that is the job of the digestive tract is to absorb and secrete. So we secrete digestive enzymes, we secrete hydrochloric acid, we secrete mucus into that digestive tract, work with the food that we've eaten, break it down into small little bits, and then we absorb it back into those cells and then from there into the blood. So a little deeper is the capillary supply that's gonna take all those digested nutrients and send it to the blood to go throughout the body. So large columnar cells for secretion and absorption. <clears throat> so in the esophagus, we have mucus secretion. And a classic symptom of someone who has acid reflux is coughing after meals because when we eat and that sphincter, that lower esophageal sphincter, there's sphincters at the top and bottom of the esophagus, when that lower one that connects to the stomach spasms, some of the acid from the stomach creeps up into the esophagus and that stimulates the esophagus to secrete more mucus because it's being irritated by acid. And that's a classic symptom then is that cough, a little irritating mucus cough, a little lower in the throat, classic sign because that mucus creeps its way up into the airways, into the you know, where the esophagus and trachea divide, right? Um, right at the top there is where that division occurs and that's where the mucus starts to collect and people feel the urge to clear their throat. So think about that with your patients. You know, they eat, they eat dinner and all of a sudden they have that kind of annoying cough. And I know it with my husband because I tell him every time, there's your acid reflux, he doesn't believe me. Now he finally does because he has other symptoms of acid reflux and I'm like, yeah, anytime you cough after meals, if it's drinking, we know it's a swallowing problem, right? But if it's just a little while after, like maybe within half an hour, then that's an acid reflux symptom. Okay, so we have um, this mucus production, and then we have smooth muscle in the esophagus. It's skeletal muscle, though, at the top of the esophagus, and smooth muscle near the bottom. So skeletal muscle, we have some control over. So when we first, um, enter into the esophagus, it's skeletal transition, transitioning to smooth. So we looked at this in lab. This is the lumen. The esophagus, when it doesn't have food in it, collapses. So it has this kind of squished appearance. The white part is the lumen that's all collapsed because there's no food in it. That's stratified squamous epithelium. And then we have two layers of smooth muscle outside of that 
which undergo peristalsis, wave-like contractions, to take that food from the top of the esophagus down into the stomach. And you can feel that, right? Have you ever swallowed something too fast, too big of a chunk, and you can, it kind of hurts as it's working its way down, right? And goes into your chest and then hits your stomach. And your stomach is kind of just below your ribs here on the left-hand side. So you can feel that go all the way down. And you can see why people who think they're having a heart attack are actually just having acid reflux because the esophagus lays behind the sternum. It goes right down behind the heart, and it's right in the same location as the chest. So oftentimes, people will think they're having a heart attack when they're having just a really bad case of acid reflux. And here's the ironic thing that's a good thing to remember, because it happened to us, happened to my husband. He had a flare-up of severe acid reflux and thought he was having a heart attack, so he drove himself to the hospital. And that's the unit I work on on call is cardiopulmonary. And he called me and he said, hey, I'm on your unit. I'm a patient. I'm like, what? And I was working. He called the secretary. And they said, oh, she's in class. And he said, OK. So he didn't call me and let me know. So I taught a whole day. And he's sitting in our unit thinking he's having a heart attack on a nitro drip, which is what opens up the vessels for people that are having a heart attack. But here's what the thing to remember that I learned is that nitro, when it opens up the blood vessels, it also relieves acid reflux symptoms. So they thought, oh yeah, he's having a heart attack because the acid reflux symptoms are going, or the chest pain's going away when we give him the nitro. But the true test, and I learned this at Mayo during my nursing clinical, the true test of acid reflux versus heart attack is to ask for a lidocaine cocktail. They mix it with a, like a Maalox and a lidocaine, which numbs the, the GI tract, so it numbs the esophagus. And if the pain goes away when they take that, that's a classic sign that it's acid reflux and not a heart attack, because uh, it's not going to affect the heart by swallowing you know, something down the esophagus. So that's what um, Mayo did in the ER with a patient that came in. They, they ruled that out right away, and I think that's a really good idea. When my brother was in with chest pain, I told him, ask for that GI cocktail. And they took that right away. It did not resolve the chest pain, so then he knew he had something else. So good thing to keep in mind for you or relatives in the future. Ask for that little numbing cocktail for, to rule out chest pain that has a heart cause. So another thing I want to mention about the smooth muscle contraction is then we can be laying down, right? And peristalsis will occur and move that food to our stomach. It's not a gravity dependent thing. We can be hanging upside down and eating a peanut butter sandwich and it'll still work its way down into up into the stomach if you're upside down. So it's a smooth muscle peristalsis action. So the mucosal lining again is just a stratified squamous epithelium for protection. That's the key thing. And we have these sphincters at the top and bottom. So this is the, the lower one. This lower esophageal sphincter is right here. And this is the problematic one that causes acid reflux. It's called the lower esophageal sphincter. And when it spasms, things can work their way up from the, di from the stomach into the esophagus again and cause that irritation and burning. And that's kind of right behind the chest. And that's, that burning spread kind of spreads throughout the chest. So do you not have that slide? Oh, weird. Strange, because that's coming from, oh. Strange. Yeah, I have it in my. Um, hmm. You know what? Maybe I just combined the two because it was a better picture. It kind of shows them both, right? So that's okay. It still it shows it just in a different form in your notes. But anyway, so certain things that we eat promote spasms of this lower esophageal sphincter and cause things to go acidic contents to go from the stomach up into the esophagus. One thing is stress. Stress causes acid levels to rise in the stomach because we know the sympathetic nervous system does not promote smooth muscle contraction in the digestive tract, right? We already said the parasympathetic neuron, when that's dominating neurons, that promotes movement through the digestive tract and smooth muscle contraction. So if we don't have smooth muscle contraction moving food from the stomach 
to the small intestine to continue the process. It builds up in the stomach, and you continue to add acid, but you're not moving things out. Now you've got acid indigestion, right? And if you've ever eaten or maybe had mixed some alcohol or some sweet beverages with a rich meal, it feels like it just kind of sits there, right? It's like, oh, it's not digesting. I feel full, and it's two hours later, right? That's a sign that, that acid levels are too high and things can't move through because we're going to learn that P the digestion is somewhat pH dependent, and when acid levels get too high, digestion stops. So that's when you give yourself an antacid, right? Something that has a high pH, like Tums, right? Or um, Maalox is something that people can take in smaller amounts. High amounts, it causes diarrhea. Smaller amounts, it treats acid reflux. Even baking soda, mixed if you're desperate, it's the middle of the night, and you don't have any of that stuff, but you have a box of cheap baking soda, it tastes terrible. But you can mix a you know, half a teaspoon of baking soda in with about maybe two ounces of water, swallow that down. It tastes bitter and horrible, but it will bring the pH up and get digestion kicked in. And it's amazing how much better you feel when you just fix that pH, right? And then within a half an hour, you feel like a human being again. I have struggled with this a lot in the past when I am not getting enough sleep and I'm really busy. That's a sign that I know my body is under stress and that I have to you know, take better care of myself. So if you guys, I mean, isn't that classic in school when you're working and taking classes? So if you're not eating well, and alcohol, coffee, tomatoes, orange juice, uh, Italian sauces, those are all classic stimulators of spasms of the lower esophageal sphincter. So if those are things that you eat, on, eat or drink on a regular basis, that's going to cause some issues. So. And symptoms of acid reflux, again, is that burning sensation, burping every time you eat, burping like multiple times and feeling like things are coming up when you're burping, and bloating. So if you eat something and all of a sudden your stomach just feels hard as a rock and it's just uncomfortable, classic signs of acid reflux. So once that opens up and shuts, the job of the stomach is to churn the food. We call this little piece of food that's coming down the esophagus, let's give that a name. It's called a bolus. So when you chew your food and turn it into a soft little mass to be worked on by the stomach first, we call that a bolus. So the stomach's job is to churn the food back and forth, back and forth into a substance known as, remember that from general A&P? Start with a C. Yep, chyme, not chime. That's what bells do. It's chyme, hard C. So that's the liquid part of food. So the longer it's in there, the more liquid it becomes. And everybody, if you have a dog or a cat, you know what chyme looks like on the carpet or the floor, right? <laughs> we had company over on Saturday. It was just lovely. Just before the company was coming, um, my dogs, my, my little ones, I've showed you my little troublemakers, the mother and her puppy ran up onto the hill in the woods and was running the ridge, chasing deer. We could hear barking way in the distance. I think that happened in class too, didn't it, last week? Or was that my biology class? Maybe it was biology. Anyway, they did that. So they were gone for a while. They finally come back. Well, the mother then is throwing up large piles of deer poop vomit. It was the most disgusting thing. And how appropriate, you know, when you're having a dinner party, to listen to retching in the back and then all this black. Oh, it was just disgusting. <laughs> but anyway, so, so it was irritating to her stomach lining, but very nasty. So anyway, uh, this chyme, this liquid, back and forth, back and forth until it's liquid. And then th very little bits at a time, only, I have a volume here, three milliliters at a time enters into the first part of the small intestine. Because remember, this is the pyloric sphincter. It's the end of the stomach. So we get a little bit entering into the duodenum. It's not duodenum. People like to say that. But it's duodenum is the correct pronunciation. So back and forth, back and forth, three milliliters at a time goes into the duodenum. So what does that mean for alcohol? Person has a bunch of alcohol, slams a beer, three milliliters at a time, not very much, right? So it's, and this is where it enters the blood, is in the small intestine. So people really have to be careful. Alcohol, blood alcohol level is rising little bits at a time. 
But we do know also that there are certain things that delay stomach emptying and promote stomach emptying. High carbohydrate, easily digested foods promote stomach emptying. They're broken down and they pass through the digestive tract faster. So that means if a person is going to go out drinking for the evening, eating something high carb is not going to really protect that stomach from delayed emptying. And when they drink alcohol, it's going to pass through their system faster and it's going to get into the blood quicker and they're going to feel the effects faster. But if a person heads out for the night with something high fat, high protein, that delays stomach emptying and that protects them from feeling the effects of alcohol right away. Or going out, heaven forbid, on an empty stomach and drinking, that's going to really raise blood alcohol levels very quickly. So if you want to go out and make it for a long time or you're hosting a bachelorette party or a bachelor party and a lot of drinking is going to be going on, start it out with a really big meal and you'll have a longer night out where everybody's behaving themselves. <laughs> so. Really? <laughs> oh yeah, no, not carbs. But now what do we feed our patients that have trouble with nausea that are just coming out of surgery? Do we let them order a burger as their first thing off the menu? Yes. No. <laughs> if they're young, maybe. Because that's what, I had a young patient last night that came out of surgery and he ordered a, three cheeseburgers. And I'm like, oh, but he didn't listen and I'm like, you know, you really should start with something mild, see how that goes, and then order. No, I'm really hungry. So, okay, whatever. And he did fine. They sat there, though, so I think he only had a couple bites. But um, So high fat, high protein, delays stomach emptying. It serves a purpose. Alcohol, dieting, right? If we bring healthy fats and low, like lean fats and, and protein foods when we want to not feel hungry, we add those foods to our diet, but if you're eating high carb things, it passes right through and you're hungry again. But you got all the calories absorbed into the blood from the high carbs, so we know that high protein, healthy fat diets um, keep us feeling satisfied longer. Okay, so we have these different layers of the, of the smooth muscle wall of the, of the stomach, so it's a back and forth mixing, back and forth from the fundus to the pylorus, back and forth, back and forth. Some will enter the duodenum, the rest moves its way back up to the fundus to be broken down until it's a liquid. So what do we have in the stomach? We have sympathetic neurons and parasympathetic neurons. So sympathetic neurons are going to inhibit digestion, right? And smooth muscle and parasympathetic is going to stimulate smooth muscle contraction and digestion. So in order to digest well, we need to be relaxed. Like my husband, standing at the island eating dinner, you know, the minute he walks to the door does not promote digestion, right? And if your person has acid reflux, they should sit down and relax and eat, right? Or if you've just eaten a big meal, relax for a little bit, sit down, read the paper, whatever. And But what is the nursing environment like? You go in the break room and you shovel it in, right? Sometimes with your phone ringing. Eat while you chart. Well, at least that's relaxing if it's not stressful charting. But if you're standing there eating because you only have five minutes to go sneak in there and grab something to eat, that doesn't promote digestion. So anyway, so that will stimulate the, via the vagus nerve. Remember, that's the nerve that kind of dominates the parasympathetic nervous system, controls the heart, the GI tract. 90% of the organ control by the parasympathetic runs through that vagus nerve. And then the blood supply to and from the digestive tract, the celiac trunk has the arteries of the digestive tract. So they bring blood to the digestive tract. So again, I was talking about, um, I think last week, when people run that are not in shape, run long distances, that blood supply is diverted to the muscles instead of the digestive tract because there's not a lot of blood vessels to the muscles because of lack of training. A lot of the blood gets diverted and that digestive tract gets shocked and then people end up with stomach cramping and diarrhea after training because they are not 
they didn't get good blood supply to the GI tract. But if a person is well trained, they have lots of blood supply to their blood vessels, so the stomach can be happy and the blood vessels can be happy with enough blood supply and then people feel just fine. So a sign of diarrhea and cramping after exercise just means a person needs to train a little more. And then remember the veins of the hepatic portal system, so that drains the GI tract and if everything has to pass through the liver. So remember, blood goes from the GI tract to the liver and then to that main blood vessel, which is the inferior vena cava, right? So remember, that's why alcoholism damages the liver because goes the alcohol goes into the stomach. Some of that is absorbed from the stomach right to the blood. There is some alcohol absorption from the stomach. A majority occurs through the small intestine. Then it travels, that blood with the alcohol travels through the liver and then to the inferior vena cava. So if we look at the stomach then, it has these little holes. Remember what we call those holes? Very good, gastric pits. That's why I like to have lab before a lecture so you have some of this anatomy down already. So gastric pits. And those pits are lined with cells. And there's a couple of different cells. If you look in, in here, I'm gonna turn this to yellow. So we have these cells, we have these cells, we have the blue cells, and down here we have these cells. So the top of the cells are the mucus cells, or neck cells. So these are at the top of the gastric pit. And what is their purpose, do you think? Why would we want lots of mucus at the opening of these pits? What? Okay, well, mucus is a thick, well, not always thick, but it's a kind of a slimy, protective secretion. So we know that the stomach also produces acids, right, like hydrochloric acid. So we don't want the, the stomach to digest itself or to break down, right? So this, this mucus has a protective purpose. It protects the stomach lining from the acids. Now, again, under stress, without that movement of smooth muscle contraction, acid levels build up, mucus production goes down as we age, so more people as they age have issues with acid reflux than younger people because of less mucus production. And then they end up with ulcers as a result of that, gastric ulcers. The word gastra means stomach. So gastric ulcer, stomach. Peptic ulcer refers to the um, small intestine. So gastric ulcers are stomach related. And if it gets bad enough, it can burn a hole in the stomach and cause infection because this, what we eat is not sterile, right? And that can be a very serious condition. So always want to take you know, acid reflux seriously and stomach ulcers very seriously. Okay, so the gastric pits then lead into these glands. And a gland is just something that is secreted locally. We talked about that before, like the endocrine system, um, they secrete to the blood. But exocrine means it secretes locally via a space. So these different cells secrete their contents into this space, which we call a gland, which leads to the surface, and then it interacts with whatever is in the stomach lining, or in the stomach in contact with this lining. Okay, so we have the, the, get, the mucus cells at the top of the pit. So they're at the top of the gland, right? Top of the pit. So that's what's labeled number one here. Those are the mucus cells. It's light pink, okay? So then we get down, well, they're labeled right here, so you don't even have to label it. Okay, so now we get down and we have these neck cells, more, more mucus. 
as we said, as we work our way down. And then we get down to the parietal cells and the chief cells. So let's talk about those. So the neck cells, thin acidic mucus, parietal cells, their job is to secrete hydrochloric acid and another substance called intrinsic factor. We'll just abbreviate it IF. IF. So hydrochloric acid and IF and chief cells, their job is to produce pepsin with the help, pepsinogen is what they produce and then that's turn, that turns to pepsin with the help of hydrochloric acid. And the enteroendocrine cells secrete hormones, which we will list in a future slide here. So they all have different jobs. We're going to go through each cell and talk about what the jobs of those secretions are. <coughs> so looking at the first one, looking this is a hydro or let's look at the pepsin, pepsinogen, the chief cells. So the chief cells are these purple ones. I'll just highlight it. So the goal of pepsinogen, it's not active, it doesn't do anything until hydrochloric acid from the parietal cell acts on it and then it becomes pepsin. And the purpose of pepsin is for protein digestion. So the only thing that the stomach can really digest is protein. It cannot digest carbohydrates, it cannot digest fats, it can digest some protein. A majority of protein is broken down in the small intestine, but there is some protein digestion, about 10% that occurs in the stomach. So what does it break them down into? What are the building blocks of proteins that we can actually absorb? Amino acids, yeah. Amino acids are the building block of proteins that we can absorb into the blood. So that's the job of pepsin, is to break down proteins into amino acids so they can be absorbed into the blood and reassembled to whatever we need to make in our different cells. So the parietal cells, they're large cells that secrete hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. And the chief cells help them by activating, or the hydrochloric, the parietal cells help the chief cells by activating that pepsinogen. So parietal cells, again, secrete hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. The purpose of hydrochloric acid is those, that low pH secretion of hydrochloric acid breaks down proteins and activates that, that enzyme or it acts as an enzyme with pepsinogen to make it pepsin, and it helps kill bacteria that might be present in the food we eat. So a couple of different functions for HCL. Intrinsic factor is important for absorbing vitamin B12 in the small intestine. And what do we need vitamin B12 for? Say it louder. For what? Iron and oxygen binding. Well, I'm not so sure about that, but red blood cell production is a key function of vitamin B12. I guess if the more red blood cells you have, the more oxygen you can bind, right? So it definitely is related. So we need this to make red blood cells. So a very, very important function. So chief cell secretions, like we said, it has this enzyme pepsinogen, which becomes pepsin. So you have pepsinogen becomes pepsin. when acted upon by HCL. And that will turn around then, 
pepsin acts on pepsinogen to make more pepsin. So it's kind of like a positive feedback cycle. But that's the job of the chief cells. And then these endocrine cells way at the bottom of the pit, so these are at the bottom of the gastric pits, closest to the blood supply, right, because deep in the mucosa below that are the smooth muscle layers and eventually the capillary layer, they secrete hormones, serotonin and histamine, somatostatin and gastrin, all promoting digestion. So serotonin, you've heard of that before, right? We talked about that as an important neurotransmitter in the brain for uh, you know, health, health and well-being. Anxiety and depression are linked to low serotonin levels. So when someone has low serotonin levels system-wide in the body due to anxiety and depression, how's their gut feeling? Not very good, right? What? Someone say something? Yeah, literally, <laughs> right, for some. So what are symptoms of anxiety and depression? Diarrhea or constipation, right? Kind of an upset stomach. So what do people do when they have kind of an upset stomach? They eat because they think, well, maybe this will make me feel better, right? So you try to go to those foods that taste good. So what is a result of anxiety and depression in people? Weight gain. What you, would you say? What? Yeah, yeah, weight gain because people just try to make their stomach feel better by eating foods that taste good, comfort foods, right? Or weight loss, right? People say, oh my gosh, you look great. What's, what's happened? Yeah, it's called the divorce diet. I lost 30 pounds because of the stress of a nasty divorce, right? Uh, it's true, it, it happens. So uh, that's the effect of those low hormones. So people find, like we had a relative that was just kind of a cranky person, and then when they went on antidepressants, all of a sudden their gut was working better, and they said, oh my gosh, you know, I have been constipated for 20 years, and all of a sudden, I, my gut is, is normal again and it feels so good. And that was just a matter of going on medicine to get those serotonin levels back up. So a um, lot to be said for, we call it the gut brain. When people are stressed, sometimes that's the number one way they can tell they're stressed. There's no, no other symptoms other than their gut is off. They have constipation and they just can't go to the bathroom. And that's a big problem in nursing because you're busy. And stress doesn't have to be necessarily mental unhappiness. Stress can be just really busy, a new job, right? And when you're running around on the nursing floor, people find that their constipation is a big problem. So, you know, drinking water and high fiber foods and all that kind of stuff becomes extra important. So these cells are down at the bottom of the pits of the stomach. All right, so uh, we have tight junctions between the epithelial cells in those gastric pits to make sure that nothing leaks between the cells of the digestive tract, causing infection and damage. And we have stem cells in the digestive tract, so we sometimes will slough off and damage cells of the digestive tract, and they are replaced, so that's a good thing. But if something gets beyond that mucosal barrier, we call that gastritis. Again, gastra means stomach. So gastric bypass, we're bypassing the stomach with that surgery. Gastritis means there's going to be nausea and vomiting. And you know, stomach cramping. Oh. Well. Oh, so I was reducing slides. Okay. And when we look at ulcers of the stomach wall, I think I said this wrong earlier, peptic ulcers are also gastric ulcers. They're the same thing. Most cases of um, gastric ulcers, stomach ulcers, are by this bacteria called Helicobacter pylori. And there's a special test that people have um, that they can test for that. And then that's great because you just give people antibiotics and their stomach ulcers go away. It's a wonderful thing. I was hoping that was the cause of my acid reflux that I had a couple years ago, but it was not. It was just stress. <coughs> So this is what a gastric ulcer looks like. It can be very serious. There's the helicobacter. 
Helicobacter pylori attacking the intestinal wall. If you're taking microbiology, and I know a lot of you are, have you talked about this bacteria yet? Maybe not? Okay. You will. You did talk about pylori? Oh. Oh, yeah, right, to investigate. Right. That's very cool. Okay. Well, let's see if it comes up yet. There's some time left in the semester. Okay, so what is the stomach responsible for? What's its job? Physical digestion, which is just the churning back and forth and turning things into chyme. So when it's done, it takes that bolus of food and turns it into chyme by churning and mixing. denatures proteins. We said with the help of what enzyme? HCL and pepsinogen. Pepsinogen or pepsin when HCL acts on it. Okay, so breaks down proteins. Intrinsic factor, we need that for making red blood cells. So if you don't have enough intrinsic factor, you end up with a condition called pernicious anemia. And anemia is low red blood cell. Red lo low red blood cells as a result of not enough vitamin B12 to stimulate red blood cell production. So these people that have just a lack of intrinsic factor because of just some, you know, dysfunction of those cells, then they need vitamin B12 injections to keep their red blood cell production up. And then we already talked about, you know, delivering that chyme to the small intestine is a job of the stomach. So when we look at this, there's a lot going on here, right? But what we see, things that stimulate secretion and movement from the stomach to the small intestine, we have different phases. The cephalic phase is the, just the thinking about food. Do you ever talk about food? at work and someone shares a recipe or just talks about a recipe and your mouth starts to water, like, oh, that sounds so good right now, right? So that's just the thought of food. That's a, the cephalic phase. It's from the brain. The brain just thinking about food can stimulate digestion and secretion beginning the digestive processes. Seeing food. How many times has this has happened with me and my husband? It's like, I'm going to get a snack. Do you want any? No, no, I'm not hungry. Right? And then he comes down and sits next to you, or a roommate, right? And you smell the pizza and, oh, can I just have a bite? I didn't make enough for you, right? <laughs> so that's. Yeah. I remember when my children were babies thinking, this is the very brief period of time that I'm not having to, sh that I don't have to share my snacks. Because once you have kids, it's like, oh, can I have some? So, yeah, just the, the sight of food um, can also. And smelling food, another one, right? When you smell something cooking, it's like, ooh, that smells good. I'm getting hungry now, right? So that's the cephalic phase. You don't even have to physically have food present in the stomach. Now, the gastric phase is when the stomach stretches. That stimulates the stomach to secrete. And then when we have chemicals in the stomach, that's going to move things along. And notice what things stimulate. Amino acids and caffeine. Caffeine stimulates the appetite. So that's why people that are trying to lose weight, they'll often, good diets will often say to avoid caffeine. And that's really tough, right? If a person is, you know, functioning on caffeine, that's a tough thing to withdraw from to start a diet. But there's a lot to be said for that. Coffee does stimulate the appetite. And then rising pH. So, you know, the food is coming in, so the hydrochloric acid is low in the beginning of the eating process and then as it increases then things slow down give it time giving it time to for those things to work on the food and break it down and then it moves to the small intestine so the intestinal phase is when the there is a low pH and we have partially digested things entering into the duodenum then that's going to stimulate more contraction to send more food into that intestine. Now, things that inhibit movement of the small in, or of the stomach 
is loss of appetite, depression, excessive acidity, emotional upset we talked about, stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, overrides that process, and stops movement through the GI tract. You know, people get really bad sudden news and their stomach just goes bad. Maybe that's happened to you. You know, you've been fine, all of a sudden you get really bad news and you feel like you're going to throw up. That happens because of that instant blocking of the parasympathetic and promotion of the sympathetic nervous system, and there's no movement through the GI tract. Genetics. Yeah, yeah. It's just some people have, you know, throughout their family line, anxiety, again, can cause more stomach sensitivity. So if people have underlying anxiety, you know, starting from childhood on, they're always going to have a more sensitive stomach just because of the sympathetic nervous system constantly dominating. That's a big factor in families. Um, and some people have what's called irritable bowel syndrome, and that affects the bowel, which feeds back to the stomach and causes, you know, cramping and people not wanting to eat certain foods because it's just they're more sensitive to them. Yeah. Irritable bowel syndrome is really common among women. They say something about estrogen is not friendly to the gut, and women have more issues with diarrhea, constipation, food sensitivities compared to men. Okay, so, and then um, when we get into the small intestine, when there's fatty hypertonic chyme, that slows gastric emptying. And that's what I'm talking about when we're drinking, right? When we're going to go out and have alcohol. If we eat something that is fatty, that slows gastric emptying and slows the absorption of that alcohol into the blood. So again, it's always smart to eat something with a little bit of fat in it. And if the person isn't worried, if you're going to go out and have a bunch of beers and you're not worried about low calorie, right, you just want to have a good time and, and stay safe, then have pizza. Pizza is a great choice to eat before going out on the town for something where the alcohol is going to be plentiful. <coughs> <coughs> so the right side is these things inhibit gastric emptying, this emptying of the stomach. These promote emptying of the stomach. So again, if we have a, uh, have a patient who's ill and has a poor appetite and just not feeling well, we want to we create an environment that promotes gastric emptying. We want things to move through their stomach little bits at a time to keep things absorbing to the blood and keep them gaining weight because oftentimes people get in the hospital and they think, oh, I don't need to eat. I'm not hungry. I, I don't have an appetite. And they haven't eaten for two days and they say, no, I'm not going to order. I don't have an appetite. Well, we don't eat just because we have an appetite. We eat to fuel our bodies and promote healing. So we don't want to let our patients be in that misconception that, well, if I don't have an appetite, I don't have to eat. Because they're deconditioning, right? The more they lay in that bed, what do we learn about muscles, right? You need to constantly challenge your muscles or they atrophy. If we let them lay in bed and not eat, they're getting weaker and weaker and weaker in our watch. And aren't we supposed to be going the opposite direction when we take care of patients? We're trying to get them stronger for discharge and recover from whatever brought them in. So we've got to promote eating. You know, that's why we have these supplements that we give people that have poor appetites. You know, so that sometimes you have to hold the container and say, okay, let's drink half of this. Can you drink half of this before I leave right now? Do me a favor and just let's finish half of this. Classic example, last night I had an extremely confused, very old man didn't know what was going on. I just stuck the straw in his mouth. And when he felt that straw, he just started sucking. So I took a little break, did it again, drank the whole thing. And then he didn't say a sensible word all night. And then he says, thank you. It's like, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> it's amazing with Alzheimer's how all of a sudden they say something totally clear when they are like been mumbling all day. So anyway. So don't underestimate the importance of just getting those foods in those patients. Okay, so these chemicals, again, acetylcholine, we know that's from parasympathetic neurons. We studied that, you know, when we talked about receptors. They bind to muscarinic receptors on the GI tract and promote smooth muscle contraction. Histamine and gastrin also promote smooth muscle contraction. Sometimes we have too much activity in the stomach, and that causes nausea. So sometimes when we give people antihistamines, it helps with nausea. Benadryl is a classic medicine that I give my kids 
when we're traveling to prevent car sickness and to help them sleep if you're doing like an over the road 24 hours straight I give my kids because um, what happens was when kids get tired and then they're in the car for a long time pretty soon they're feeling nauseous and saying they're gonna puke and then life is terrible for everybody in the car right so about eight o'clock at night I would give everybody a Benadryl and that would allow them to sleep for four to five hours prevent car sickness and people feel a little bit better. Now, I'm not someone who promotes giving kids Benadryl to sleep at night because they don't know how to go to bed on their own. That's not what I'm promoting. <laughs> but Benadryl is good for anti-nausea. So it's a great thing to give kids in the car. And it's good for pets. Pets can get um, Benadryl. So if you have a dog that's kind of wild and gets sick in the car, give them some Benadryl. It'll make them sleepy in the car, and it'll help with nausea. But make sure you look online what dose to give them based on their weight. Okay, so they block hydrochloric acid release and they prevent that nausea. <clears throat> so here is a very complicated diagram of how the body makes, how the parietal cells make hydrochloric acid. So I do want you to know some details of this. And here's the key thing. <clears throat> it happens inside the parietal cell and what is it using to make hydrochloric acid? Well, if we look at what happens is carbon dioxide, dissolved carbon dioxide in the interstitial fluid enters in by diffusion, simple diffusion, into the parietal cell and it forms carbonic acid. So it combines with water. Carbon dioxide and water form carbonic acid. We're going to talk about this little process multiple times, especially in the respiratory system. So in uh, um, acid base balance. <clears throat> so it forms this carbonic acid. That carbonic acid then is a weak acid, which means when we have a weak acid, we look at what the reactants are, carbon dioxide and water form carbonic acid, and then that carbonic acid breaks up into ions in a different way, which means we have HCO3 minus and H plus coming off. So this will let me write over it. It will. Okay. So I have CO2. You know what? I'm going to just go to a Word document. It's easier. So here's how this works. We have CO2 plus water forms H2CO3, which is carbonic acid. But it's a weak acid, which means that some of it is going to break up into ions. This is just a chemical reaction. Some of it's going to break up into ions, which is not this, not carbon dioxide and water, but it's going to break up into H plus and H HCO3 minus. So it's a chemistry thing that we're not going to analyze. We're just going to take it at face value because you guys um, are supposed to have had chemistry already. Do you remember these details? My guess is probably not. <laughs> But that's okay. That's okay. That's why we're going to revisit just the basics of what we need to know. So I'll, I'll clean this up so it looks chemistry friendly. Okay, so this is what happens in our parietal cells. We have carbon dioxide and water. Where did the carbon dioxide come from? Very good. Interstitial fluid, it's always there because we're producing it as a result of metabolism, right? Via the Krebs cycle. Combines with water, forms this weak acid. This is not right. Ah. One more thing is that. Okay. Oops. H2CO3. Okay. All right. So then uh, forms this weak carbonic acid, that doesn't do anything to pH because it's all together, it's all bound up together. But then when it breaks up into these ions, remember this, this, this H plus is what the pH scale is based on. So how much H plus is floating around in solution is what drives our pH up and down. And we know the more H plus in a solution, the lower the pH. That's a chemistry concept. So these things are floating around in solution now. Okay, so this happens in the parietal cell, this formation of carbonic acid and then the breaking into these ions happens in the parietal cell. 
And why does it happen in the parietal cell? Because it has the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. So carbonic anhydrase is necessary in order to take carbon dioxide and water and form carbonic acid. And then again, just based on, chemical, based on chemistry, this carbonic acid, some of it will break up into H plus and HCO3 minus. So the H plus is kicked out of the cell by this special pump that's an exchanger. It pulls potassium from the lumen, from the fluid inside the stomach, and dumps out H plus as, result, as a result. So we're not losing any charge because we're exchanging one positive charge for another one. But we need H plus in the lumen of the stomach so we can hook up with Cl to form hydrochloric acid. So does everybody understand where the H plus comes from? Ultimately, the H plus comes from carbon dioxide in the interstitial fluid. Would you agree? If we don't have carbon dioxide in the interstitial fluid, we don't have the CO3 por or the CO2 portion for carbonic acid to get that H plus off. So this carbon dioxide enters into this reaction. We get H plus out in the lumen. The, the bicarbonate ion leaves the interstitial, or I'm sorry, leaves the parietal cell, enters the interstitial fluid, and diffuses into the blood. And we need this bicarbonate ion to lower the pH of our blood. This is an important player in keeping our blood slightly alkaline. Seven point do you remember the pH of blood? What is it? 7.35 to 7.45. 7.35, 7.45. Okay, but you don't need to know that now. We'll, we'll revisit that concept in a future unit. So bicarbonate ion enters the blood, but again, we're losing a negative ion, so when we lose a negative ion, we have to grab another negative ion in this antiporter protein, and this one is the bicarbonate chloride antiporter. So we know chloride is part of salt that we bring in. It's always hanging out in our interstitial fluid. It's one of those ions. It's always outside of cells. So as bicarbonate ion is produced and transported out of the cell, it exchanges chloride into the cell, which will diffuse through open chloride channels to the other side and enter the lumen. And out here in the lumen, the love affair occurs, and they meet up, and we have hydrochloric acid.